During the last decade of the 20th century, 30 new diseases made their first appearance, never described before. They appeared suddenly, without notice, putting public health organizations around the world on alert and holding a threat over the global economy. They all share two characteristics, a tendency to turn into an epidemic, and wild animals transmit most of them, practically all of them. Today, we witness the outcome of one of these diseases carried by an animal virus. The virus abandons its habitat and readies, minute by minute and by chance coincidence, for an outbreak all over the world. These are the makings of the first pandemic scenario in the 21st century. Is it an isolated incident? Are we witnessing an increase in infectious diseases from animal viruses? All new diseases that have been described in the last 10 years are virus-related, the smallest infectious agent that exists in nature. They have names like Hendra, Nipah, SARS, and viruses with no name they've appeared suddenly, inducing epidemic outbreaks that only international collaboration has been able to stop. The list continues to grow. Since 1997, there's been a new animal virus preparing to jump to another species. It's called H5N1, Influenza A, an avian influenza virus. From the Asian mainland, it makes a vicious entrance. And despite the enormous distance separating them, here in Montana, the United States, in labs embedded in the Rocky Mountains, they're waiting for it. The scientists are getting ready to work under high biological security conditions that'll permit them to investigate the new virus and others already established without the risk of infection. The appearance of these infectious agents that jump from animals to humans, spreading diseases, sped up the construction of this pioneer laboratory designed for their confinement. It's the great project of this scientist and international expert in this investigative line, Marshall Bloom, manager of the Rocky Mountains Laboratories, United States. We have to worry about them because we never know when somebody who's on a safari or a hunting trip or a fishing trip yeah. in Africa or South America might become infected with one of these level four agents, come back to the United States and come, and come down with, with the infection. So even though these viruses don't occur in the United States, it's important for us to study them because you know they, they're there today, there today, but they could be here tomorrow. And we have to be prepared and we have to learn about them. Most of these viruses live in their hosts without provoking the disease. H5N1 uses wild water birds. It multiplies inside them, developing shape shifts, mutations that enable them to jump from the animal host and infect a different species. It can be a different animal or a human. It's a species shift and a virus can do it without warning. You know, if we look at the most recent example of a virus which people are really, really worried about. I think we have to look at the, the avian influenza outbreak which is continuing in Southeast Asia right now. And there are a variety of different kinds of influenza viruses, but the one that people are so concerned about at the moment is one which is affecting 
bird populations in Southeast Asia. And the worry is, so there's a disease which is definitely coming from animals. We even know the animal is going to be a duck or a chicken. So the worry is, is that that virus is going to jump from, popu from a virus which infects ducks and chickens and infect people, and that somehow that virus will gain the ability to spread readily from person to person. To jump to another species, viruses can develop and change their characteristics, their structure, in the matter of a few decades. In order to do the same, an animal would need hundreds of thousands of years. It's like comparing the evolution of a fossil to the corresponding live animal. History shows that in each species jump, a new virus appears, creating a disease for which we have no defense at all. This is the fear that H5N1 arouses. And these are viruses, influenza viruses of a type that no one in the world has any immunity to, which would set us up for another uh, pandemic influenza virus, uh, an, an influenza pandemic where millions of people around the world could be affected. Asia is prime breeding grounds for respiratory disease viruses, the influenza. These viruses periodically jump from wild water birds, their natural reservoir, to humans. Each new outbreak, each flu wave, each time we're infected, it's with a virus that once lived in Asia and likely reached us by hitching a ride on wild water birds. But each 40 to 50 years, always with the imperceptible chance of biology, a completely new flu virus arises and leaves a characteristic track. It's a deadly virus for a great number of birds. For now, H5N1 is following step by step what other new flu viruses have done before when creating a pandemic. The species jump starts inside the wild migratory birds. These transmit the virus to domestic farm birds. It normally happens due to mating between wild and domestic ducks. The domestic woos, the wild fall for it, and both share a place where the virus is expelled and passed on from one duck to another. This is how the transmission chain begins. The infected duck will pass on the virus to the surrounding fowl in the farm or barnyard. And in this new host, the virus mutates and for some unknown reason, it becomes especially potent. Today, H5N1 is practically unstoppable. Never before has a bird virus caused 100% mortality in birds just 48 hours after infection. Never before has a bird virus affected so many countries at the same time. Vietnam, Thailand, China, Korea, Cambodia, Turkey, and countries of the European Union. It's a new virus, and when it jumps to human beings, it'll find a completely vulnerable population. The concern is echoed from investigation laboratories to international organizations that watch over public health. There are constant meetings in the GORN, the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network, in charge of the surveillance and control of epidemic outbreaks. H5N1 has set off the alarms much more than any other infectious agent. The Goran spokesman has been alerting all governments for eight consecutive years of the menace that this virus carries. Dick Thompson, Goran spokesman, World Health Organization, Switzerland. Yeah, I think that um, what would make us very concerned is if we heard that um, an influenza virus had acquired pandemic characteristics. That means that it was moving easily from person to person, causing severe disease. Our concern right now is that there is a virus uh, circulating largely in birds. Uh, this is avian influenza H5N1. And that this virus, for just a few dozen people, um, ha ha has moved into just a few dozen people, causing severe illness, causing a large number of them to die. Since 1959, there have been only 11 known occasions in which a bird virus has managed to jump species and infect a human. Six of these jumps have taken place in the last two years, with a death rate never seen before in an avian virus, at least not in recorded history. Most of these jumps have been made by H5N1.
this virus at this moment can only move from animals to humans but it has the potential, it can acquire the capability of evolving or recombining with another virus so that it will move easily from person to person. In September 2004, virologists from all over the world met in Madrid for the second European Congress of Virology and alerted the whole world about H5N1. The warning took all the media by storm but in a couple of days, it was lost and forgotten. Juan Ortiz Monton was at that meeting. This scientist has spent most of his career studying flu or influenza viruses. In 1997, when this virus surfaced in Hong Kong, jumping directly from birds to humans and leaving six casualties among the 18 people infected, Juan Ortin knew that the H5N1 virus was here to stay. Juan Ortin Monton, National Biotechnology Center, Spain. The H5N1 virus that is affecting birds and humans lately comes from a virus that was isolated in China, in Guangdong, in 1999. This is a sketch of the genetic contents of that virus, which we here represent with eight red lines, to be able to tell them apart from the rest, and which correspond to the eight genes of that virus. Later on, we could see that in the wild, in birds, not only in geese, which was the species in which it was isolated, but in all birds, it's been mixing its genes with other H5 genes too, and other subtypes that infected other birds in the wild. This is clearly represented here, seeing how the genes that the viruses contain, isolated in the years 2000, 2001, 2002, etc., are each time even more different from the original virus. When a virus exchanges one gene with another, it obtains a new quality. Inside each gene, there's a different feature. It can turn more contagious, more virulent, infect new types of cells and jump between species. The H5N1 virus has continued to exchange genes with other viruses, mutate and gain new qualities since it surfaced. Most of the viruses isolated in the year 2004, as we can see here, contain only two genes that came from the original virus isolated in 1999. And the rest of the genes come from other viruses that were infecting other birds in the wild. This is the virus that has caused so many problems in both poultry and humans in Southeast Asia. What happens if an H5N1 infects a human already infected by a common flu virus? The avian virus could adopt genes from the common flu that allow it to infect humans and transmit itself from one to another. The result? A pandemic virus. This is why the principal measure against H5N1 is controlling its presence in birds. More than 160 million birds in Asia have been slaughtered in order to avoid giving H5N1 any chance to jump to humans exposed to infected animals in places like farms. But Western countries are not compensating for this sacrifice. For many farmers, the fowl are their only way of life. The direct agricultural loss is already around 10,000 million euros. But the loss and damage that the bird flu causes on a wide swath of the population, completely unprotected, is incalculable. As a Goran representative, Maria Chang has traveled to the countries where H5N1 outbreaks have been affecting animals. She's pessimistic about its control. Maria Cheng, Guarn, World Health Organization, Switzerland. As long as we have avian influenza circulating in animals, we can expect to see cases in humans, so there's no way to really control this problem without going to the root of it, which is animals. Right now, there are huge numbers of chickens and ducks, domestic poultry that are not regulated, so we have no idea what the disease level is in these animals. Um, in China, for example, there's 14 billion domestic poultry 
only about 20% of those poultry are regularly monitored and vaccinated. So we don't have any idea what's going on with the other 10 million poultry. So that's a huge number that we're concerned about. Due to the close quarters and handling of the infected fowl, the virus is infecting more humans each day. The infection takes place when the contaminated particles in the environment are inhaled. Those particles are a threat for up to 35 days. Each case in humans is a new opportunity for the H5N1 to gain the property it needs for transmission from human to human. But avoiding the infection between birds is not enough to stop the virus from going human. This is because viruses have another very efficient evolutionary tool. They are capable of doing so themselves. A virus is a parasite. It needs to infect a cell for it to be alive. Once it infects the cell, it starts to multiply itself internally at great speed. It photocopies itself. This is its grand strategy. The smallest infectious agent that exists can replicate and multiply again and again, thousands of times in a cell, millions in a body, who knows, maybe to infinity. The problem with some viruses like the avian is that its photocopy machine is deficient. It's not accurate. It's constantly making errors so the copies are defective. The resulting viruses take advantage of these defects to gain new characteristics. They're created with frequent mutations, changes, with a new personality. They are mutant viruses now. This is a three-dimensional image of the real Xerox machine. It's called polymerase, an enzyme, a unique molecular machine designed through millions of years of evolution, is copying the H5N1 virus at full speed. You can expect anything from a virus that's mutating. It can gain new characteristics that make it disappear, or on the contrary, enable it to jump species and infect human beings. The World Health Organization has all this data, and this is why it has set off the alarm regarding the danger that the constant mutation of H5N1 can lead to transmission between humans. Um, we won't know until that virus emerges what the case fatality rate is going to be, how lethal is it going to be. But we do know right now that it will cause a, a, a huge demand on healthcare services. A lot of people suddenly will need hospitalization or intensive healthcare um, response. So we know that once the pandemic starts, we don't know how many people will die, we don't know how lethal it will be, but we do know it's going to be a huge strain on the public health system. If the virus jumps to the human population, its transmission will be very effective. Influenza viruses can float in the air for hours in the tiny drops of saliva that we cast out as we speak or cough. In a simple sneeze, we can free up to 150,000 viruses. This is why the flu viruses infecting people are able to travel around the world. We have no immunity. The strike of a new virus could affect 20% of the world's population, around 1,200 million people. It's possible that a vaccine uh, could be made available that will take several months once the virus to, uh, emerges uh, so that it's available to even a limited number of people. A lot of countries won't have an opportunity to buy it. They'll be left without a vaccine. Right now, the virus that we're looking at only responds to one class of antiviral, so there's probably only one drug that may be available. And that drug may not be available to a large number of people in a large number of countries. So what's important, uh, what we can do right now, what countries should be doing right now is preparing. And that means developing pandemic preparedness plans. Should workplaces be closed? Should schools be closed? Make a decision about mass gatherings. Uh, what do you do with a limited supply of antivirals? Who gets those? Are they first responders? Each time H5N1 infects a person, it causes a very serious lower lung pneumonia, similar to the disease caused by another flu virus in 1918. That agent spanned the world over in just six months, 
infecting 500 million people and killing 40 million of a predominantly young population. The virus reached remote areas of the planet from Alaska to the most isolated Pacific Islands. Today, the world's population is three times bigger than in 1918, and it's much more concentrated in city centers, optimal conditions for the virus to spread in the air. Now, there are more than 200 um, uh, countries in the world right now. We've seen uh, pandemic preparedness plans for fewer than 50 of those countries. And some of those plans actually are not, um, they're in the very early stages of, of development. So we think the world right now is inadequately prepared uh, to deal with a pandemic influenza outbreak. It may or may not occur, but in the meantime, people wait defenseless against the looming threat. Urgent measures are needed. The gathering of antiviral drugs that haven't yet been proven effective and vaccines that won't be ready for months. There are those who are critical of alarming populations when H5N1 has not reached their societies. There's no pandemic scenario yet. Ildefonso Hernandez reminds us that there are other urgent diseases and a vulnerable population unable to protect itself. Ildefonso Hernandez, president of the Spanish Epidemiology Society. We're going to reduce the impact on whom, on which populations, and in which countries. This must come first because maybe part of the world will get ready, this we can be sure of, but another part of the world will not be in any way ready for this impact. While the nutritional level and health services are at a very high level and well organized in developed countries, in other countries it's completely the opposite. While in developed countries, deaths due to complications like, like pneumonia can be reduced since there are high quality health care services. In other countries, in the so-called third world, the pandemic impact will be much more serious because there are many people with a very deficient immune system either because of other diseases like HIV the, the AIDS virus, or malaria, or because of the miserable nutritional level that extends throughout large areas of the world, making this population very vulnerable and helpless against situations such as these. Today, H5N1 is spreading through migratory birds, infecting the population and inducing a high death rate wherever it goes. That the virus will end up passing on to people is both a matter of time and chance. There's no biological law in this case, just pure luck. Of course, it will start at one point, and from there, in just six months, it'll spread from one person to another throughout the entire planet. H5N1, or the mutant virus that'll come from it, will have bid farewell to his host, the migratory bird. It will never again be a bird virus. A new infectious agent will adjoin the growing list of viruses, all coming from wild animals and infecting humans all around us. <laughs>